Okay, review session. So number of questions showed up on Slack. I promise I'm gonna to try to give this quickly to you guys. So four of us here, so um, you can still use Slack next week and ask me questions after class. I know that timing isn't optimal, that we can't do a review next week on Wednesday, so prior commitments. Um, but we'll squeeze it all in and get everything to work. Um, and I'll organize something that makes a lot of sense next week. So, and if you guys have any great ideas, let me know. Okay, rap problem. Um, let's start there. So, we're gonna have a lecture on this next week. Um, possibly on Friday, this will show up. So, I'm just gonna tell you what the problem is real quickly since one of you guys asked. But here's the, the basic problem. So we get to see rat weights. So rat weights at time t. So I'll say the weight of a rat at time t. Certainly the Gelfin and Smith paper is going to use different notation that I'm going to pick for all of this. So I'll try to be close, but we need to be nimble to our notation. I can remember what the model is. And so what they want to do is they want to study how the rat weights increase over time. So a lot of clinical trials are like this, that they come up with some magic potion, they give it to a rat, and they measure how things evolve through time in some sort of a longitudinal analysis. This is really simplified in this analysis that all the rats survive through time. Okay, so in a, real, in a real survival analysis model, you have rats being introduced to the study late, and some of them die, and you don't want to throw away all that data that's really informative. So you can read the paper and see the context of this problem, but I want to point out that this, they started chiseling away at this in like 1988, and this paper gets published in 1989. And if you go and you query the authors on this paper, you'll see about four or five different versions of this paper. And in 1990, there was a Gibbs sampler paper written for JAZA by Gelfand and Smith, the two statisticians on these papers. So the other authors are the scientists that have the question. Um, I just want to show what the model is that they use to study rat weights and how they evolve over time. And so this is what they do. So I think. Usually, in modern days, we probably build a real time series model here, but we're not going to do that. So a real time series model is probably you're going to regress current time on previous time in an autoregressive manner. We'll take care of those models later in class. We'll study them and play around with them. Um, so this is a pretty clunky model, but I'm just going to write it down. If this is going to be alpha plus beta times time. This is time. This is an intercept. And this is, of course, your slope plus ART. And this right here is going to be um, normally distributed with mean zero and variance sigma squared. So the typical sort of regression phenomena. There's more to this model. It's not this simple. We wouldn't need a Gibbs sampler if it was this simple. We would know how to find alpha and beta half pretty easily. This is time right here. And so the idea is that rats are going to put on time in a linear manner. Is that realistic? Maybe. So, I don't know, I haven't seen the rats. You have to plot their weights. But there is a linear assumption right here. And so, um, and it's linear in time, right here. So, I don't know if that's reasonable. You'd have to look at data. If they were parabolic or something like that, then they might have a time squared term in there. So, anyway, what they do is they think that each rat, so I'm just gonna say, I'm going to label this, and I'm going to say this is rat i. So of rat i right here. So this is the ith rat. The ith rat is going to differ from other rats 
and then its coefficients are going to be different right here. So it's going to have its own coefficients, and we're going to watch each rat and see how it puts on weight through time. The idea in this model is that every rat has its own set of linear coefficients, but they're different from each other. And so and we can try to figure those out for each rat. But there's some underlying distribution of these parameters. So this is a pretty typical sort of old clunky statistical model. We're not really saying anything about the physics or the biology or the genetics. We're just looking for a trend. And so in this model models that trend. And so if this for rat I was negative, it would mean that it's decreasing weight over time. So maybe they do something to the ith rat and it lowers its weight compared to what they do to the other rats. Maybe they do a little bit different treatment to each of the rats and they want to study how well it puts on weight or takes off weight. This is the initial weight. So initial weight. Now you might know what the initial weight is and you might be inclined to just stick it in right there. But we want our models to fit right. And so, again, we're not interested exactly in the physics of the system, but we're just interested in trend. And so this is approximately the initial weight. So at time zero, right here, there's some weight right here, and it's somewhere around there in this normal distribution fashion. So this probability error term is giving the model flexibility. Um, let me give you an example of why you don't want to shove the intercept in. Imagine baby weights increase linearly through time, and that's approximately true. So you put on weight as the years go by, you kind of put on weight in, to some level. Assuming that you, know, you didn't go on a steroid diet or something like that, or you, you know, had some hunger strike, it's probably fairly linear. Um, What's a baby's weight when it is first conceived? It's zero. Yeah, it's approximately zero, right? And so when the baby was first born, it's like zero, but it's not, right? So we might know it's zero, but it's not zero because we don't know when we started measuring things. And in fact, things might not be linear. So we start to measure a baby's weight at about nine months. So, and it comes out and there's some approximation to it. And so we don't want to just shove in like a zero right there. And I will point out in every linear model that you're playing around with, if you think the intercept is zero because that's the physics, still put that thing in there because it might not actually be a linear trend. So if you have data that looks something like this, and it looks linear right here. And then all of a sudden you say, oh, I'm going to force this line to go through this point. This is your zero you might come up with that line and it's not a great fit to your data. And so you want to estimate that intercept and maybe that intercept has an interval around zero that you could measure. And so again, we're soaking up a lot with our assumptions and statistical models and just kind of looking for trends. So it's a pretty clunky model. Um, there's a connection between these two parameters that people want to understand. So just a quick question, we'll go through a real lecture We'll probe the class so you can be thinking about this. Do you think these two parameters right here have any relationship with each other? The propensity to put on weight might have something to do with how much weight you came into the study with. So I've seen this kind of at the gym. You know, I don't go to the gym anymore. I think you can tell. But <laughs> when I used to go, you know, you'd get these guys in there and they're just super skinny and they stay super skinny. Like it just does not change, you know? <laughs> so kind of their initial weight maybe has something to do with it. And sometimes you see people that are maybe a little bit um, heavy and they're going to the gym and trying to lose some weight and maybe they're able to take off weight real quickly because of that. So it's hard to say, but there probably is some relationship between these parameters. And that's the scientific question. So that they want to know, does the initial weight have something to do with the rate of putting on weight? They want to answer that question. So they're going to add this other layer to everything. They're going to say alpha i, beta i, so this is a vector, is going to be distributed normally. That's their relationship. Um, it's going to be centered somewhere, alpha naught, 
beta naught. And then there's a covariance in here. This is normal distribution. So bivariate normal. Then this right here, it's a matrix. It's a two by two. So you have a variance for each of the things. So this will be variance for alpha, this will be variance for beta, and this will be your correlation parameter. I guess I'm saying it's the covariance between alpha and beta. So I think they're trying to understand this number is, are they correlated or is that a zero? So they want to test that. They want to estimate that parameter. And so you have this big hierarchical model. So I'll just continue over here. So this is a hierarchical model. can say words like hierarchical and remember how they're spelled, but I can't say the word continuous. <laughs> so I'm about to have a stroke or something. <laughs> so I was just tired. Um, so this is a hierarchical model, and it's a particular type of hierarchical model. So the idea is, is that the rats have their own parameters. So there's some like genetic um, random pool of parameters. So while we're not actually studying genetics, you know, the idea is that um, the hand of creation came down for rats and pulled out its set of parameters, and there you go. That's going to model your genetics, this alpha and this beta. And so this right here is the population mean. And so that population is centered around some, somewhere, and there's some distribution of these parameters. And so, and there's some sort of covariance that models those things. And that's common to the population. Um, so this is a particular type of hierarchical model. This is what's called a random effect model. And you've probably heard that term before. So I'll give you another example. This would be maybe your classic Wikipedia example. Um, say that there's five different STAT 101 professors. And each one of those professors teaches a couple different STATS classes. And they all have a standardized test. So I think we have that sort of stuff. You know, they get together, synchronize their testing. They're all supposed to be measuring the same thing. The students are kind of assigned at random, at least in an idealistic world. Um, and so there might be a difference between the teachers, you know, whether or not the scores are high or the scores are low. And there certainly is. And so I don't think students actually select classes randomly. You go to Coopers or something like that. And you're like, what's the grade distribution like out of this professor versus this one? And everybody wants to get into this other section. So it's probably not quite random, but that would be an example if every, all the assignments were random. And so you might want to measure what the teacher effects are and see if there's differences in the teaching effects. So um, there certainly are. So that's what's called a random effect model. So things might be related within a particular group. The group that we're studying here is the particular rat, and we get to study it over time. And so that rat has something to do with itself. So if you were studying maybe um, populations of baboons, somewhere. So I used to have a lot of friends that would go out there, dark baboons, go and study them, see what they do, put trackers on them. Um, and there was a relationship between the baboons that what the father would do, the kids would do. So they would have behavioral issues just like their fathers. So people are kind of, that are related, tend to be more similar. And we see that in our own families too, that there's a relationship. And so, you know, if I were trying to study something about individuals, I might want to control for that sort of grouping effect, that they're more similar than across the boundaries. So this is one type of random effect model. Um, 
I'll say a lot about these models, you know, how frequentists think about them and how Bayesians think about them. But what I'll say right now is this is part of the model, but it looks and feels an awful lot like a prior. You know, Bayesians are always operating hierarchically. So I'm putting distributions on parameters. So what a, a frequentist might do is they might use this random distribution, so they're building a distribution on alphas and betas, but then they might look at maximum likelihood estimates for these parameters, right here, and maximum likelihood estimates for these parameters. What a Bayesian's gonna do is they're gonna let this random effect distribution, which looks and feels like a prior, but it's part of the model and it has kind of this mechanism that everybody agrees on. They're gonna use it as though it was their prior. And they wanna learn these parameters right here and they'll place priors on them. And then find the whole joint posterior distribution of everything that they wanna learn. I, they're gonna want the distribution of that so that they can understand that thing right there. That, that, and all of these as well. So they're gonna come up with that big joint posterior distribution. How did Gelfin and Smith think about going ahead and getting this? They created the Gibbs sampler. So they're gonna write down their full conditionals. They don't know what that whole big distribution is. So there's a matrix. There's this vector right here. So matrix, vector, across, across rats. I've got some number of those. So let's say there's cap i rats. Then I have cap i plus two things that I'm estimating. Each one of these vectors are two dimensional. So cap i plus one times two parameters, plus four parameters, plus one more parameter. This is a relatively big distribution. And so sampling from that complex space might be hard. They broke everything out into a, a Gibbs sampler. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna figure out what the full conditionals are on this parameter, that parameter, that parameter, and these as well. And so while we wouldn't say this is a prior, if I didn't tell you, and I said it was a prior, it just operate exactly the same way. So Bayesians with random effects models, it's, you're in your natural paradigm. You don't change flavors of math. So the classicist or the frequentist or some other brand of not Bayesians, um, they're gonna probably maximize those parameters right there, talk about the distributions of that test statistic, and then they would have this random distribution. So they're kind of partially acting like a Bayesian, they're at least applying Bayes' theorem. So, but the reasons you come up with the model in the priors might be different. So I have to write down what the likelihood is. So the likelihood for this, this is the whole key for figuring out the, um, full conditional distributions. I'm gonna tell you about Wishart distributions later. They're gonna be the distributions on matrices that we use. This is a little bit confusing, because you actually use a Wishart distribution on the inverse of this matrix, called the precision matrix, and you use an inverse Wishart if you are using um, sigma. So the reversed, it's the opposite one. So they kind of look like higher dimensional gammas. So we'll study that. So inverse Wisharts look like gammas. Inverse gammas look like wish arts. Ah, I wish they didn't do that. So it is what it is. Okay, um, I need to give you a little bit of notation. So just real quickly, I'm gonna say this is gonna be theta i right here. That's my new notation for that. And this is theta zero. That's a vector. So sigma, will leave sigma in there. So I have a model for pi theta i, given theta naught and sigma. Coming up with the right notation will make everything not a total mess. Um, I'm gonna say t goes from one to cap t, and i goes from one to cap i, just to make things easy. Okay, so I'm gonna rewrite this real quickly so I can do some notational compression. 
when you guys go to figure out the full conditionals, you're going to untangle everything. You're going to you're going to write it out in long form and recognize everything. But I'm going to write down this thing right here. I'm going to give it some matrix notation. So I'm going to say this is theta i times one t. Let me just show you. One t theta i is the same thing as alpha i theta i, which is equal to alpha i plus theta i t. Same thing. So I've got a little bit of matrix notation here. We can leave it like that if we want. But this would be my X matrix. It's the way I parameterize everything in standard, you know, and use linear algebra to do everything. We'll break this down eventually. But this is a probability distribution. I'll say F W T I right here, given um, theta I, all the T's. I'll just leave them in. That's kind of, I'm gonna call this x t and so if i have all of my x's i'm going to call that cap x so i'll just plug in real quick i have the data but it's really just x t so just a little bit of notation and then i've got the air term sigma t oh sigma squared we might think that there's a rat specific variance or maybe the variance changes over time if you want to do that, you can build all that complexity into your model. So this is relatively simple. So I've got this distribution right here, and I've got that distribution. That's the hierarchical model. So let's just think about, for each rat, the likelihood is going to look like this. So this is going to be t goes from 1 to cap t, and then I'm going to have f W, I, T, given X, T's. Theta, I, and sigma squared. So this is rat I's contribution to the likelihood. And I can write down what that looks like for you in a second. How do I end up writing the total likelihood over everything? All the rats are conditionally independent. The rats are not independent because they have some parameters in common. You know, they have stuff underlying them that is shared across the models. So these are not independent, but they're conditionally independent. And so what I do is I end up just writing down, this goes from um, I goes from 1 to cap I. You want to be very careful when you do this. Just know when it's where. So this would work out without that. But once we start applying priors to this, we want to see where the prior is getting multiplied in. So, and then there's this other component for each one of these things. There's this thing right here. So let me write it out just a little bit more. So up here, same thing. I goes from 1 to I. This thing goes from T goes from 1 to cap T. I have F W I T given theta I X T sigma squared switch around my notation a little bit because it doesn't matter. So this thing right here is closed. And then I've got this, pi theta i given theta naught sigma. And that's being producted together this many times. So it's really a question of how many times this comes into it. So when I see a model like this, I'm thinking, 
oh, to generate samples from this, I know what these things are. I plug them in. I sample a theta i. I plug that theta i in. And then I sample my vector of rat weights. That's the same thing over here. So I sample theta i. I plug that thing in. And then I sample my vector of t rat weights. So how many draws did I take? One draw here for each rat. And then cap t draws over here. Boom, 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 boom. The whole sequence of time. That's what's happening here. So I grab, for rat i, I grab its weight, I plug it in, and then I sample all my w's. And then I do it again for the next rat weight. Grab the next rat weight, plug it in, sample all of my w's for that particular rat. And so the same number of draws that you're taking from the distributions, if you're thinking about this as a sampling distribution over W, that many terms needs to appear in the product. So this is that likelihood. It's also the joint sampling distribution. It just depends. If I plug in these parameters right here, I sample, and then I'm drawing the Ws, it's the joint sampling distribution. If I plug the Ws into all of this, and then I try to estimate all these parameters. Right here, I make this a function of those parameters. It's the likelihood function. So I always think about the sampling process. I write down that sampling model. Then I have the likelihood. So let me just finish saying a few things about this. Just write this thing out. So if we're going to, we need priors. So we'll need priors. Our priors are going to be pi sigma. I'm probably going to introduce you to pi sigma inverse and then have you work a problem on the uh, homework that deals with the inverse. There's some interesting relationships, and you can only remember it if you kind of hassle yourself with the different versions of it. So this is going to be a wish arc distribution. So it's a distribution over matrices. It's a height a high dimensional version of a gamma. It's a matrix variant of a gamma. So all those little trace problems and determinant problems, we're going to use those when we talk about which are distributions. Jen? Oh, so is that the term uh, oh. likely? No, I need more. So is that the likely? Yes. So if I plug in W, this is the likelihood. This is it. So I'm done. So that's it. So again, the way I figure it out, and this is what you want to become a master of, is if you see a hierarchical representation of the model, you can write down its likelihood. Card-carrying Bayesians know how to do that on a whim. So, and non-Bayesians usually struggle with it. And so it's just as easy as just writing down a closed form version of the sampling model. And so pretty easy. You could simulate this model so you can write down the sampling distribution. So we'll need priors. A prior on sigma squared. I'll probably put a prior on phi and invert that thing. We'll probably put a prior on this thing inverse. And we'll see why. Um, this is going to be a firm which are, we'll talk about this. Lecture to come. This will probably be a gamma. That's what they used in the paper. It's the conjugate prior. This is the conjugate prior for these matrices. Um, we're going to need priors on theta zero. Peter, which prior would you pick for theta zero? It's alpha naught, theta naught. Yeah. What's conjugate? Normal. It's a normal. So bivariate normal. Good job. So we're starting to scale up the dimensionality of all these problems. Um, and then, let's see, I guess that's it. So we've already got the distribution on these things. This is called a random effect distribution. We don't need a prior on it, it's already random. And so we'll need to work out the full conditionals for all of this. So I'll just point out 
If you're working out the full conditional for this thing right here, and this was the question, which part do I need to look at? So sorry for the over explanation, but you just need to look at this part right here. And it gets producted up that many times. So you'll have all these theta i's. So the full conditional for this. Proportional to the likelihood on sigma inverse, given all its stuff right here, times, oops, this is going to be given everything else. So full conditional. Pi sigma inverse. So what does this look like? This is going to look like this. I goes from 1 to cap i, pi, theta i, theta naught, sigma inverse, and the brace is there, sigma inverse. You'll notice in this full conditional, everything in here, there's no sigmas, cap sigmas, right there. So this is acting like a constant for that particular term. There's nothing being updated. Everything is held fixed. And so this just falls out of its full conditional. It's just a proportionality constant. So you just have to look at where that parameter appears. So it's going to look like this. What is this thing right here? This is e to the minus 1 half theta i transpose sigma inverse, oops, theta i minus theta naught transpose sigma inverse theta i minus theta naught. This is going to look like sigma inverse right here to the half power. If you like your sigmas downstairs, you can do that. So this is a special property of determinants. It does this right here. So these are the same. Sigma to the half power. So that's determinant right here. There's the root 2 pi, and this is a two-dimensional, so you'll have root 2 pi squared that shows up. If you wanted to see the full sampling distribution, so 2 pi square root, but it's two dimensional, so that thing gets squared. You might wonder where the, is there a power here? The determinant right there, if this was like sigma squared times i, then it's just going to be the sigma squared, and it's going to be raised to the um, to power in here because you're just producting down the diagonal. So it appears over and over again. So this is right. So this is a bivariate normal. You want to check your matrix dimensions. This is a vector that goes like this. This is a vector that goes like that. This is a square. This had better be a scalar at the end of the day. So it's a scalar. So it's just a big inner product. So that's what this part looks like. Um, let's do another one real quick. And you would use um, the wish R prior that I'll introduce you to. So there's a conjugate prior for this. It makes everything convenient, and you'll be able to sample directly. So both MATLAB and R have built-in facilities for that. If you couldn't do it, you could run Metropolis Hastings. So since there's built-in facilities, you wouldn't want to waste your time. Okay, so let's do one more, just to get the feel for it. So full conditional for, let's do the next one. Well, this one's too easy right here, but for phi, full conditional, 
you'll start to like the notation because you don't want to write down all the stuff over and over again. This is going to be proportional to the likelihood for phi given everything else times pi phi. This is going to be a gamma. In this thing right here, where does phi appear? I need to look for it. This is where phi appears. 1 over phi. It's here. In this part. There's no phi's over here. So now this is acting like a constant. So it's this chunk is the contribution of likelihood to its full conditional. And so we can write that thing down. This is just going to be product t. But just keep in mind, this appears right here. This doesn't matter. But how many times is that appearing in the product? Both of these. So this gets producted up all the time. So this is a much bigger product. So t goes from 1 to cap t product. i goes from 1 to cap i. Let's just write this thing down. This is going to be phi to the 1 half, e to the minus 1 half, w, i, t, minus. I think you use x, t, theta, i. Yeah, exactly. So x, t, theta, i. Myself smaller. Product i goes from 1 to cap i. Product t goes from 1 to cap t. Phi to the 1 half. E to the minus 1 half. W i t minus x t theta t. Now you'll start to like this notation. This is theta i. Transpose. This is one dimensional, so I'll put my phi there. This is going to be squared because that's all just scalar. So that's what this part looks like times pi phi. So if this is an arbitrary gamma right here, once you product everything together, it's still some gamma. So you'll have this double sum up here, right here. And this will get producted up cap i times cap t times. So there's a lot of lending of information in hierarchical models. So it's not that things are independent. It's that theta i appears here and here. So it's the thing that ties all the information together, the theta i's through the random effects. And so this right here does have some influence on this, but it's through the theta i's. And so those will all appear in this other full conditional. And we can work that thing out. So pi theta i, given everything else, it's going to be some normal. And you would update those. Where does it appear? Well, for each theta i, you would need to update these. So there's going to be a whole bunch of these distributions right here. And they're just going to be, its contribution is going to come from just one of those with one of those. So it's just going to be not a product, but just that one for the ith one, and that one for the ith one. So it's going to be a product of those two terms, and everything will be normal. So because this is normal in theta i, right here, at least it looks normal. You can see that right here in this chunk. So it's a e to the minus quadratic. It's what those things look like. And this one is normal. And so it'll be a bivariate normal. Theta naught will be similar. It's also going to be a normal. You're only going to have one of those. Where does theta naught appear in all of this? It shows up here. So this whole chunk falls out. There's no theta naught there. And so it'll be this times those right there. And that's where the theta naught appears. So this one right here will be proportional to i goes from 1 the cap i, the inner product falls away. Everything is constant. There's no theta knots there. So you want some tiny notation so you can spot these things real quickly. This will look like um, 
E. This is all just the normal model, the one half theta I minus theta naught transpose sigma inverse theta I minus theta naught. I don't need to write the sigma right here because we're working on the full conditional for theta naught. So in this distribution, the sigma is a constant. What is random right here is this value, part. So you would spot this and probably flip those around so you put them in the random variable location. By convention, I always make that the left. Yeah, but I just need to look at what the random variable is. This is going to be multiplied by its prior, and the prior only comes in once. You don't multiply the prior over and over again. There's only one prior on a set of parameters. So pi theta naught. This is an e to the minus quadratic in theta naught. This is an e to the minus quadratic in theta naught. So you'll look for the quadratic term. It's going to be a, the thing that lives between theta naught transpose theta naught. That will be your quadratic term. So, so it's the thing that's inside of it. And we'll get lots of practice with that. Um, and then you'll look for the minus two linear term, minus two theta naughts, whatever is multiplying by it. I just multiply by the inverse of that variance function and I'll get the mean back. So you use the exact same method, but you just do it in multivariate land. Same stuff works. Okay, that was locked. So we'll see most of this again. So yeah, only these small little chunks um, come into play. That is the question, right? Yeah. Yes. So when you showed us how to do the likelihood, that pretty much got everything. That's it. Yeah, totally. I should have just jumped <laughs> to that for you. Well, the rest of it may help to make more sense. Yeah, exactly. Jenny. Professor, could you repeat the part about the theta i? About the light. About theta i. About theta i? Yes. So this one? Which one? You didn't do that yet, but you, I, okay. I think I heard you mention you For theta i. That. Yes. This one's going to look like this. Pi theta i. I guess since I've done all the other ones, I might as well do this one. <laughs> So, where does theta i appear? Remember, it's the i-th index, so it only appears once in this product, and all the other ones are irrelevant. There is a lot of information being shared in the other parameters that tell us about theta i's. They're being conjoined by this stuff right here. So once I can figure out what theta naught is, I learn the whole relationship between all the theta i's. And so, where does theta i appear here? It only appears once. So this is going to look like this proportional to F W I T given theta I X T oh. this yeah I I made a mistake Jay. that's probably why you're calling me out each of these appears T times it's boom 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 That's what you wanted me to clarify. Yeah, I said it wrong. And so, and then I'm going to have pi theta i, given everything else, all the, that stuff. We can write it in. It's not too many things. It's like theta naught sigma. So yeah, there is a big product in here for each theta i. You've got all the time points telling us about that parameter. So yeah, good job. So those are all the full conditionals. And then it's just a matter of recognizing which distribution they're at and being able to pluck off, you know, in some nice form, its parameterization. If you do this without writing everything out in vector form, it is a nightmare. And I can't tell if you've got it right. And when you go to code it up eventually, you're going to make mistakes everywhere. And your code will run slow. You'll have rounding problems, all kinds of issues. OK, let's move on. Um, normal sampling. I'm just going to say this quick. So there's a transformation. I'm not going to prove this right now. But the transformation looks like this. This is called the Box Mueller algorithm. It's really cool. Um, this is just a transform. So if you've taken a multivariate 
probability class, which everybody needs to have taken to have any chance of success. <laughs> so um, you can work through this joint transformation. And so you will have to, when you work out the derivatives, the Jacobian, you're going to have to take derivatives over arc tangents, I think, things like that. Um, and I'm not going to go through all those details right now. But this is called the Bach Mueller algorithm. This samples normals. Is this what's going on under the hood of the R norm? Yes. Absolutely. So every package has a uniform generator built in. Back in the 60s, they used to study the properties of uniform generators. And so um, there were periodic samplers, conjugental linear samplers. They don't work very well in high dimension. You can start to see patterns. And so the one that everybody uses now is called a, um, the Merzing twister. In the math exceeds my ability. You know, I've looked at it a couple times, and it's like some branch of mathematics that I don't understand. So you can look that up. But it samples uniforms for you, and they have nice properties in high dimensional spaces. So pretty cool. People have figured out how to sample uniforms, and the name of the game is to use those uniforms to create, through transformations or algorithms, other random variables. So this is a perfect sampler. Meaning, these are just transforms. I don't have to wait for convergence. So no wait, no, no convergence issues. No convergence. So this isn't a thing in perfect samplers. So in MCMC, we have to wait until eventually our draws reach stationarity. This doesn't happen. So this is just a transform. So here's how it works. I take two uniforms, U1 and U2, and I get them from our magical uniform 0, 1 samplers. The Merzine twister is the one that everything will invoke these days. Borland used to have a linear congruential generator that was OK, and it had to be parameterized a certain way, and that was 30 years ago. So that's the latest competitor to this thing. And the Merzing twister wipes it out. So it gives you better uniform looking stuff in high dimensions. If we were in a Monte Carlo class, we'd study that for about a week. Um, if we were in the 1960s, we'd study that for the entirety of the whole class at most. So we've moved on and just accepted we know how to do this. So two uniforms, we're gonna get them independent. So these are gonna be independent. Here's the transform. So I'm going to get Z1, and this is going to be the square root of minus 2 log U1 times natural or base 10? the natural log. So anytime I say log, uh, I mean yeah. I, I learned that on one of the homeworks. Okay, cool. <laughs> oh, <boy>. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so sorry, I probably say it once. And I snicker to myself when people ask, you know. So, but I'll give you the hint. Computer scientist says log, they mean base two. Uh, usually a civil engineer or something means base 10. So um, it's hard. The acoustic guy's like, what's a decibel? What base is that? Ten. It's not. Oh, so it's calibrated so that um, a 10 decibel increase is, um, no, 10. ten. So 10 times louder is what it's, so 10 decibels is 10 times louder. So I think it means for something to be twice as loud, so it's the three decibel increase. So it's a scale that people don't understand. Who knows, they just wanted 10 to be 10. So 10 times louder. I know that because of my motorcycles, so I know what a decibel is. So when people say, that's like 40 decibels higher, and it's like, that would blow up the planet of the <laughs> So it's actually like two decibels higher, but it's really loud, yeah. So.
So and you have to measure it at the track. Okay, so let me finish the um, transformation. This is going to be cosine of 2 pi u2. And then I'm going to get another one. So for two uniforms, I get two normals. So this is kind of cool. So log, I never really do put ln, but I'll do it for you guys. Sign 2 pi u2. So if it, if it wasn't, um, Base 10, it wouldn't, it would change the scale of everything. It would change it, it would still be normally distributed, but it wouldn't be a normal zero one. So here's that. These things right here are independent normals. Normal zero ones. Or I could write it like this, Z1, Z2, is bivariate normal, centered at zero. So when I write that, I mean zero, zero, and this is gonna have the identity right there. So they're independent of each other. Jenny? Because I think I missed the introduction to this problem, so I'm confused. What exactly are we doing? What is that doing? Somebody asked, the second question on the list was, how do you sample normal samples? So how does a normal generator work? So not required for this class. It's nice to know. So there's a direct transformation. We can spend a little bit of math, take the ratio of these things, you'll see the tangent show up, invert that function, so and come up with the bijection between everything and come. So this is a bijective mapping. So we can convince ourselves of that. These are independent, but notice that I used U1 and U2 in both of these equations. So how do we know these are independent normals? You can see it instantly because cosine and sine are orthogonal to each other. So they're independent. So if I took the inner product of those two spaces, it's always zero. So they're independent. Um, we'd have to do some math to show that these are normal zero ones. But I think Patrick asked on Slack, how does a normal sampler work? So Box Mueller. It's this. This is the box Mueller transform. If you want me to go through the math, I could do it, but I need a little bit of practice. So to go through it and to work out the Jacobian so that we don't spend 45 minutes, we probably do it in about 10 minutes. But I would say as a good exercise, if you ever get bored in graduate school, because I know I was all the time, um, pull out a book and look it up, or look it up on Wikipedia, and they'll have the derivation for you. Um, if you really want to know, you stop by my office, and I had it written down in one of my filing cabinets, and I'll just hand it to you, and you can take a picture of the transform. So, anyway, I just need to cough it up. So, but it's in any standard Monte Carlo book. They'll run through it. So, a little bit of trig identities and taking derivatives over trig functions. That's all you have to do to show it. But without going into the details, this is what it does. It takes two uniforms, and it transforms them into two normals. They're pretty cool. You can kind of see, well, a normal is e to the minus something. So it's kind of like a circle. It's the way I think about it. And you see this thing pop up. So it's this circular transformation. Enough said about that. Jeffrey's prior. I'm just going to tell you what it is, Jenny. Um, and then we'll have a class on it. So that will come up next week. But it's good to get started. So Jeffries. I'll point out his name is Jeffries. It's not Jeffrey. So the reason I point that out all the time is I see people do this. Jeffries is prior. It's actually like this. Jeffries prior. So Jeffries is the man. So he's a physicist. And he was interested in this problem of, well, if I pick my prior on some transform scale and you work under a different parameterization and use the same prior, we're going to come up with different answers. So it matters on which scale you actually operate on. So 
Um, let me show you a non-invariant rule. So flat priors on everything. So whatever your parameters are, no matter how you parameterize the likelihood, just pick it to be flat. It's really appealing, you know? And I wish you could do that. So I wish, and this is the whole Bayesian thing. And so if I could transform and still have uniformity, we wouldn't live in a universe that looks like this, I can tell you that. So it'd have fundamental repercussions. So, um, but like, so for example, if I ended up picking a flat prior on feed, and you were working with sigma squared, so let's say experimental one picks this, does that. And experimenter two uses the same rule, flat priors, but they like thinking about sigma squared. So let's imagine we're dealing with a normal model. And they're thinking about sigma squared. So this is experimenter two. They have the same likelihood functions inherently the same sampling distribution. It doesn't matter how they encoded it. The likelihood's the same. So all they're gonna differ about is the priors. And this is what the big deal is, is we have to be careful in which spaces we're applying which priors to. So experimenter two follows this rule, this non-invariant rule, which is not good. So they pick flat prior. They're gonna come up with different answers. So if experimenter two transform this prior, they're gonna be ultimately working with something different. So if experimenter two said, I'm not gonna follow this rule, I'm gonna pick your parameterization flat prior on the precision. Experimenter two it looks something like this. So if I ended up taking D is equal to sigma squared, so I'm gonna end up transforming this one right here. So I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna to try to figure out, and let's just give it some notation. I'm gonna call that pi phi of phi. So we know what our pi's are. I wanna figure out what the implied prior on sigma squared would be. And I'm gonna change my notation. I'm gonna call it V because I don't want you to think that's an operator. So you'll see why in a second. So I'm just gonna call that V right here. So the implied prior on this is gonna come from our transformation. So that's gonna be pi, phi, and anywhere I see phi, I'm gonna shove in a one over V, the inverse function, and then I'm gonna take my derivative. Right, like that. The inverse. Now you understand why I don't want the square sitting there, because it'll confuse me. So, taking a derivative with respect to V right here. So this thing is one, because I'm using that. And then I end up doing this, I bring down my minus one, absolute value kills it, and I decrement by one. So this is gonna look like one over V squared. Now you see why I didn't want the sigma squared squared. So if somebody says this prior right here and everybody agrees, then if you are operating on the variance scale, this would be your implied prior. So you, this guy would be out of luck right here. He would be coming up with something different. He disagrees with this one. And so Jeffries realized that, I think everybody realizes it, and thought we should come up with rules so no matter what parameterization you're working in, 
we all have the same prior if I follow this rule. Here's an added bonus. In one dimension, these um, are what are called the reference priors. So the minimal impacting prior. And so in our beta binomial example, beta half half is the Jeffries prior. And it had really good coverage properties. It had good frequentist properties. So I'll tell you what the rule is. So this is an invariant rule. And I have to say invariant to what? So I mean that I'm changing something, but something doesn't change. So the prior information is going to be the same no matter which space I'm operating in. So this is a transformation invariant rule. i.e., just to break down what it means, um, if we apply this rule, it won't matter which parameterization we choose. the idea. Now, there's an infinite collection of these. This is a really good one. It matches a lot of other things. I don't know if Jeffries knew that at the time. So I'm not convinced that he did. But he had other good reasons. He didn't know what reference priors were because they hadn't been invented yet. So it's kind of nice when everything starts to align. People come up with other ideas and they're the same in some dimension. So here's what the rule looks like. This is Jeffrey's prior. So if I want to make it possessive, the apostrophe comes after. So I'll call it pi j for Jeffrey's on theta, whatever theta is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the expected value, and this is going to be over the sampling model. So I'm going to take whatever fx given theta is. Okay, so there's just one data point that's needed in this. You don't need to product together a bunch of data points or anything like that. It's not like the Kramer route thing. So I'm going to take a derivative over this, I have a couple choices. I'm going to do this one. Oh, I always forget this log. Which log? You know. So if I use a different log, it won't matter because it'll just come out as a scale factor and I can renormalize everything. So these priors are always defined up to proportionality. So scale factors won't change anything. So log f x given theta. So I'm going to plug this thing in right here. I'm going to operate on theta, so I'm treating this as a likelihood. So even though I've written it out as f of x given theta, you're plugging your sampling distribution in. As soon as I treat that, it's something I'm kind of touching it like it's a likelihood. So I take the second derivative right here. There's a minus sign right here. So this will be negative. So we can prove that later on, this whole thing. And then this is going to be, oh, and I should probably tell you which expectation we're taking. We're integrating out the data space. So there's no data that you plug into this. So I'll rewrite this in just a second a different way. And this will be raised to the half power. So this is called the Fisher information. 
the Fisher Info. And the Fisher Info is usually written like this. Expectation, X given theta, log, derivative, and there's only one derivative in this representation that I'm writing, log fx given theta squared. So this is the Fisher Info. And I'm just going to make a note. So what I mean by this is if I can switch the order of differentiation in integration, if I can swap those, that's what's called Fubini's theorem, then this thing is equal to minus expectation, and this is the way we just wrote it. So derivative d theta squared log fx given theta. So keep in mind, this whole thing right here is going to be the integral of the derivative of the logarithm fx given theta squared. This is going to be with respect to fx given theta dx. So there's no x in the equation, because if you integrate it out. What I mean when I say if foo beans applies, I mean that I can switch the order of these things. So if that's applicable, then you can use that formula. And I always like taking this one, because if I'm working on a, something that's log linear, usually by taking more derivatives, I knock out the parameters turn things into constants quicker. So if there was a scalar, if there was a random variable that appeared after I took one derivative and there was still a theta in there, so I take the second derivative, that theta turns into a constant and that's easy to deal with. We'll see examples where we might prefer one form over the other. When you can't do this is if the parameter lives on the boundary of the space. Peter's certainly familiar with problems like this. I usually crush you guys with this in inference class. Uniform. And I don't do it here. What's that? Uniform? Exactly. Uniform zero to theta or something like that. Um, you wouldn't be able to use this form right here. But this always applies. And so you can notice real quickly, this thing is always positive. because You can see it right here. So this is called the information I theta is what we call this. So Fisher Info. This comes up a bunch of times in statistics. The inverse of this thing is usually a bound on variance. And it might be tight. So we won't talk about that. So this thing right here is negative. That's going to be negative, and it's going to make everything positive. You just have to work through a little bit of mathematics to see that. It's not obvious just by glancing at it. Um, so this right here is just i theta to the half power. And what we'll be able to show is some relationship. So we'll show in class, I'll spend a lot of time doing this. So we'll show later. Next week. And these are kind of nice problems, because if I ask you to compute a Jeffries prior, you don't have to think about anything. You're just into cruise control. Jen? It's your model. So you're plugging your model in, whatever f of x given theta is. So as soon as I start operating on theta, I'm treating it like a likelihood function. So I always say the log likelihood right here. And so this has two different, so this right here, I'm acting on it like it's the likelihood. And here I'm acting on it like it's the sampling distribution. So I end up treating it both ways because I do integrate across that x. So what is it? It is what it is. So it's a formula. Now we can see this. Where? 
On this one? Yeah. I I'm took two derivatives here. I'm trying to compare that. Oh, yeah, that is one derivative. Play around with it. If you want to go through this sheet of mathematics to show that this is true, I'll be impressed. So, um, but it's a fun calculus problem. Just work through it. And you can see that, oh, it's Fubini's theorem needs to be. So we know this already. We know that pi, and I'll just write this thing out, is equal to, oops, let's just say theta right here. So for whatever this thing is, I'm going to take pi phi, whatever that is, and I'm going to write out this thing in terms of some inverse function. Then I'm going to take a derivative g inverse phi, phi phi. So this is a rule that probability distribution is followed. See, Peter? Yeah. So we know that rule. So this is also true. We'll show this. So we already know this. And we'll show that i theta is equal to i, and I'm just going to write it out as phi whatever its function is in terms of phi, d g inverse phi, d phi squared. So this one is squared right here. So we'll figure this out. I just need to walk through some calculus and show you that. So if I take a half power here, and I take a half power there, this is that rule. So this function right here, information to the half power, is a transformation invariant function. And it follows the same property that probability distributions follow. So when I transform them, they transform to the right thing. So I'll, sh I'll just tell you this real quickly. And we'll do a couple examples in class. I'm not going to do them right here. But if you want to get started, that i mu is going to be a constant. So when I take the half power of it, half power of a constant is a constant. So i on phi is going to be proportional to 1 over phi squared. Well, we've seen this prior before. When I take the half power, that will go away i on sigma squared, which I usually call b, once we start doing this and operating on it, this is going to be 1 over b. These transform into each other. Let's just check it. So just real quickly, not hard to do. This is going to be the half power right there. So this would be the Jeffrey prior on b. J. If I had this, pi phi is proportional to 1 over phi, and we've been advocating that for a little while now. So we like this for lots of reasons. Now we're going to have one more. Um, if I wanted to figure out what pi v was, so this is going to be um, phi is equal to 1 over v, so v is equal to 1 over v. Or by, that's a bijective thing. So this thing right here is going to be equal to pi phi. But I'm going to plug in everywhere I see a phi, I'm going to plug in a 1 over v. We'll do that in a second. And then I'll take this derivative, v inverse. Let's do it. So this is going to be 1 over 1 over v. This is going to be 1 over v squared right here. Same reason. This is really v. So this multiplied into each other, v times 1 over v squared is 1 over v. And it's that. So if we both follow the rule, and you transform your prior into my space, you'll notice we'll have the same priors. So I need to say a few more things about why we like this rule. 
um, but it's a rule that most people will default on. And so it's kind of a nice rule. So at least it kind of takes away the worry of which parameterization. I don't like these because it's too automatic, but I use them all the time. Still like you to think about it. Steaming, it's late. I'll do it if these guys want me to do it. So Steven wants me to show that this is a Cauchy distribution and it's a multivariate Cauchy. The trouble is, is I need to give you a linear algebraic identity. And so I'm gonna have you keep working on this. And so I'm gonna post on Slack when I get home an identity that you need for all of this. So what you're gonna wind up with, and this is probably what you're agonizing over, is you'll wind up have this thing, pi beta, after we integrate out everything else, you're going to wind up with this determinant of some matrix plus some other matrix. And I'm going to write it out like this, x, x transpose. And you're going to wind up with this thing. So once you do all your integration, and you integrate over gamma, if you let these be a half and a half, you're going to wind up with some function like this. This is going to look like the normalizing constant um, for the, this gamma distribution that you're playing around with. What you need to do is you need to think, you need to put it into a different form so you recognize this thing as a multivariate Cauchy. So this is going to be a multivariate Cauchy right here for betas. And this is a vector. Multivariate Cauchy's look like this. One plus, I'm going to write it out like this, X transpose minus mu, let's call it Z. Z transpose minus mu, that's the center of the Cauchy, transpose, sigma inverse, Z minus mu. And this is going to be over the degrees of freedom. And this is going to be the degrees of freedom plus the dimensionality of the problem, divided by 2. So multivariate Cauchy's look like this, and you can compare that to the kernel of a univariate Cauchy. So where you have the scale parameter sitting down here and the degrees of freedom is here, and the dimension of the problem is one, so you have this plus one sitting right there. So you'll be able to squeeze in the dimensionality of everything and understand it. You're gonna do the same tricks, but there's an identity that you can use. And so I'll just write down you need this. Actually, I'll just tell you right now, so that I won't have to put it on Slack. But this is the step you need. So this is called um, this is a Sherman Morrison Woodbury. Have you guys seen this in mechanical for doing inverses of matrices? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. There's an inverse version of this, and that's what derives this identity. So Sherman Morris Woodbury formula for determinants. And it looks like this. So A plus um, X beta X transpose. This right here I'm denoting is a vector going in this direction, and this is a vector going in this direction, and this is a matrix right here. So this is a matrix, and these are all conformable, so everything works. This is gonna look like this. A, inverse, determinant, B, inverse, determinant, so I'm kind of like factoring out the B's and the A's and spinning them around is where those come from, times this. B inverse plus 
x transpose a inverse x. So I think I just told you the identity that you need. So you need this. So I kind of like you guys to suffer on this for a little while and get some formula where you're like, it's a scalar, but I don't recognize that it's a multivariate Cauchy. And so this thing is that, I want to just point out that I swap these things. So this is an outer product, and it's still a matrix at the end of the day. So this is a matrix. This is a matrix right here. This is an outer product. And this is an inner product. And so this is all just going to be a proportionality constant in our case, because the random variable is going to be showing up as these things right here. But use this identity. This is what you need. And that's it. So chisel away at that. And I'll see you guys. Steven, welcome back. Um, I just answered the wrong question for you amongst three of your colleagues that were sticking around in the review session. I was walking down the stairs and it occurred to me, I answered the wrong question. So I'm thinking into the next homework. Um, you will use that identity that I alluded to later on the next homework, so keep it in mind. Let's get to your question. So this is gonna be beta as a normal distribution. It's gonna have some mean. Um, I'm just gonna write it down like this, mean. And it's gonna have some variance, and this is gonna be a matrix. So p-dimensional. And this is going to be, this is P by P dimensional, and this is P dimensional. In the context of the problem that you're solving, this is X transpose X inverse X transpose Y. This one was um, sigma squared over gamma x transpose x inverse. So let me call this thing v right here. And then I'm just going to end up writing v over gamma. And so we can just use this as notation just to make everything a little bit cleaner. But this is still the answer to your question. And you're going to have this. It's going to be some gamma. And there'll be these two parameters, alpha and beta, floating around here. Um, this is a different beta than this one, so I'm going to change the notation briefly to AB. Again, for this to be Cauchy, this should be a half and a half. I'm going to leave these as placeholders. So here's the integral that you want to work through. So this is multivariate normal. So I'm going to have the 1 over root 2 pi to the p power. Then I'm going to have my variance matrix, 1 over gamma variance, and this will be to the half power right here, e to the minus one half gamma, my notation is beta minus m transpose, um, this will be a v inverse, so this is v, v inverse over gamma, the inverse comes out and that gamma appears right here, v minus m beta minus m, and I think that's right. And then I'm going to have the kernel of a gamma distribution. I'm not going to write everything up to proportionality, so I'm just going to be working through this as pi beta. So I'm going to write it down as given a and b, these two parameters, and you'll be able to figure out that a half and a half is a thing that turns this into a joint Cauchy, or into a, yeah, exactly, a joint Cauchy distribution. Okay, um, so this is going to look like gamma to the alpha minus 1, e to the minus beta, and this is unfortunate, but this is a, this is a, sorry, this is a gamma, gamma b. Okay, so not that unfortunate. So integrate this thing between 0 and infinity. Your mistake is probably right here, is what I'm guessing. So we don't care about that, and so I don't care about this V either in all of this. Um, I will have it where I need to in the kernel of everything. But this right here is going to be the same as, remember this is 1 over everything. So 
So this whole term is going to be proportional to, I'm taking a derivative, a determinant, I've got a scalar in here, so I can factorize that scalar out. I guess we can keep it like this for a second. One over gamma. This is going to be, this scalar gets pulled out and it gets raised to the p power. And then I have v to the half right here. And there's an over 2 right here. So there's a power of p that shows up. And that's probably the, where the mistake is. And so I'm just going to replace this with the part that matters. The part that matters is gamma, because that's what we're integrating against. And a random variable is still going to be beta in all of this. So this is going to be a gamma to the p over 2. And so when I combine everything, that's what all the magic happens. So this is a kernel. of a gamma, and I can look for its parameters. So this is one of them, and then I've got this other bit right here. So I'm just going to replace that with plus alpha minus 1. And I identify that first parameter right here. So this is p over 2 minus 1, and this is going to be the rest of it. I'm going to take that 1 half right here and write it down right here. And so here's where I identify the second parameter. But I have to remember that I've got this other part from the gamma distribution. So I'm just going to consume that in here. So plus B. So this is going to be beta minus M transpose V inverse beta minus M over 2. So this integral integrates to what we know it does. So it's going to be proportional to this thing. I'm going to call it beta tilde. And this thing right here, alpha tilde. So this is going to integrate to gamma alpha tilde over beta tilde to the alpha tilde. This is going to be proportional to beta tilde to the minus alpha tilde. And so you can finish writing this down. Remember, this whole thing is a scalar right here. So you've got a little bit of math to do. But at the end of the day, you have something that looks like this. So beta minus m transpose V inverse beta minus m plus b. Did I not get that? This is plus b right here. That's this one. So I missed that. So plus b, we need that. And this is going to be raised to the minus this thing. Um, I made a mistake again. This is plus alpha. So this is going to be raised to the minus p over 2 plus alpha. I'll put that all in there. And so almost everything is done right here. I'm going to write this down. I'm going to factorize out this b. So I'm going to pull it out here, replace that with a 1 and divide this by b. And remember, I made a mistake again. There's a 2 down here, and that 2 is right here. So I didn't factorize out the 2. I just factorized out the beta. This is a proportionality constant, so I can get rid of it. So I don't take b and make it 1. I divide by that b so that everything works out. And now you're in good shape. So you want the degree of freedom of this to be 1. So this is equal to 1, and you want this thing, so plus 2a, yeah, that's right, plus 2a. So that's the same thing that I had before, 
We want this to be one, the degree of freedom. And that should do it for you. Sorry about that, you guys. But I think everything is corrected now. I'm going to go home. <laughs>